but yes, Gail gave a beautiful introduction to where we've been last week, and we've been coming with this other common thread. Um, basically, the theme being, you may be the only Bible somebody to read, so if you walk into a church, that's not good enough. Yes, of course, this is the house of God. We are the people of God. We want to learn more about God, but guess where the warfare really is? Outside these walls with the non-believers and the people that don't know God, but they may know God through you because they're reading you. They're watching you. They're analyzing you, maybe even critiquing you. So here is the example. As these glasses go on my eyes, I can finally see the back wall and what time it is, which is very helpful, but what I've realized is my conduct in my example, my Christ-centered character becomes the bifocals that somebody else puts on. You see, when I walk and talk like Christ, it's as if they put these bifocals on and they now can see clearly exactly what I represent. So last week we were in what was called being devoted to decrease. And, and Gail kind of gave this little beautiful synopsis about what God has given us. And I explained it in T, so um, just for reasons to remember, it is our time that God gives us. It's our talents, it's treasures, material things, possessions, and then, yes, even trouble that God entrusts us with. And the idea is, what are we giving back to him for his glory? He'll take it all, by the way. That's what the cross means. I'll take it all. All. So one of the lyrics, this has nothing to do with the message. We'll get into that. I want to sound really smart tonight, as you can tell from the, the title of the message, The Chemistry of Impact. But before we get into that, one of the lyrics we just sang was, Oh, to be like you, I give all I have just to know you. Did you catch that? Well, hey, if this is all you get out of tonight, let me tell you this. Jesus already gave all he had to know you. And just by that thought alone, if you can imagine, we can wrap our hearts around that God gave everything up in heaven. I often say he bankrupted heaven to come down to earth to grant us salvation that we don't deserve, a grace and a new beginning. Now, we have to learn this salvation because people are looking at us and they need to see it in us. So what is the chemistry of impact exactly? Well, let me take you through being devoted to decrease, devoted to Deny yourself. We talked about that last week. Do you remember? Being devoted to deny yourself. What did Jesus say? He said, if you want to come after me, you need to do a couple things. You need to deny yourself. Why? Because self gets in the way. In fact, in your life, in my life, when self wins, we lose. Self is selfish. Self is the flesh that you're wrapped in. Self doesn't want to help. Self doesn't want to serve. Self doesn't want to cooperate. So we deny self, then we take up the cross, personal. It's, it's custom fitted for your shoulders. And that cross symbolizes pinning down your flesh. And when you pin down the flesh, that decreases and the spirit of God begins to increase. Now we were in John chapter three last week, verse 30 specifically, where John the Baptist says these seven words and it was a must statement in his life. He said, he must increase and I must decrease. Now, I have many musts in my life. I must do certain things. That might not have been one of them back in the day. For him to increase and for me to decrease? Well, step one, be devoted to deny yourself. Step two, be devoted to detach your grip from the world around you so that God's grip can have a greater hold on you. What is your hand holding on to that God wants to touch and bless, but he can't? because your hand's there. Last Thursday, I talked about even family. We want to have our hands on family issues, um, problems, situations, and because our hand is there, maybe even on a wayward child, I don't know who I'm talking to, a prodigal, but your hand's there, and God can't put his hand there because your hand's there. So my challenge was, we need to be devoted to detach ourselves from the world around us so then God could put his hand there. And then we went into the third step, being devoted to deflect attention. When somebody comes up to you and wants to give you a compliment, or they tell you about how good you are, or amazing worker you are, or the million other compliments that come across to us, can we, as quickly as it comes in, deflect it to where it belongs? Can I give it right to God? Hey, thank you very much, but by God's grace alone. Amen. Devoted to deflect. Don't want people looking at me. Don't want to be known for doing good. I want people to see God. I think Jesus said that. Let your light so shine before men that they may what? That they may see your good works 
and glorify him. Jesus moved in such a way that the focus wasn't really on him. Every time he did something, people glorified at his father, devoted to deflect the attention, and finally, being devoted to diminish outside voices. Why? Because whatever has access to your ears has access to your heart. When we are devoted to diminish these outlying voices in our life, we diminish the influences of media, of print, of TV. Now, we wonder why we have miserable thoughts in the morning because we're spending our final waking moments at night watching late night talk show. I want to learn to diminish these voices. They don't have a say in my life anymore. So today we're going in a completely different direction. Um, I wanted to call it a parallel message to last week. We're dealing with the same theme about decreasing, but almost decreasing to such a level that it's elemental. And we become just an element. The law of his element, where when we place our lives into God's hands, he is the agent that does anything good or glorious. It's not me. So where do we go from here? Well, we answer two questions. Why did God save us? Anybody ever thought about that? Why did God save us? Ready for the answer? So we will be with him. That's why God saved us. Then why didn't he take us when he saved us? Why did he leave us here is the second question. You ready for the answer? To lead others to him. Why did he save us? To be with him. Why did he leave us here? To lead others to him. That's our mission. That's our purpose on earth. So let me begin tonight's lesson before we get into the actual text from Colossians, going into a direction from last week, explaining how in our lives, when the presence of Jesus increases, when he increases and everything else that is not of him decreases, then the influence of God will begin to come out of me and impact others through me. Does this make sense? often think about, why do we go to church? Why do we congregate? Why do we come together like this? Seriously, is it just to hear a cute message? Is it to be entertained? Think about it. It's socially acceptable to go to church. People get together on Sundays. They put their finest attire on. They march through these doors. They sit down. They sing songs. They hear a good word, and then they leave. So I thought about seven days a week, Monday through Sunday, and I realized God didn't just call me to be a Christian on Sunday. He didn't call me to be interested in influence and impact for his kingdom just on Sunday. He's called me to be a seven-day Christian. He's called me to influence people in every single day of the week and in every action and activity that I come into contact with. I am to be God's influence on earth. He's entrusted it to me. It is the law of his element that explains catalyst impact isn't about what I can add. It's about what I can subtract. It's about getting out of God's way so that he can work through you. It's good to have your part in life. It's good to be a part of things. I'm doing my part, we say, right? But that's not what God wants because you can do your part and not be in his will. God wants to partner up with you to do his work. Totally different. So we call it the chemistry of impact for a reason. Last time we were together, I ended with this analogy, if you remember. Got off a plane, and it was fresh. And it dealt with the flight attendant. Do you remember this? And the flight attendant was instructing the people on how to put on the oxygen mask. And with very explicit instructions, the flight attendant says, hey, when it drops down from the the center or, or ceiling compartment, first put the oxygen mask on yourself. Before you do what? before you can help or instruct the person in the seat next to you. The idea here is God has given us oxygen. It's called salvation. It gives us room to breathe. It's delivered us from ourselves. It's delivered us from sin. It's delivered us from our past. And it's with that oxygen that I learn how to inhale. I learn how to navigate salvation. I have room to breathe. That I then can take that instruction 
and help the person that is journeying in the seat next to me. That's the law of his instrument, or that's the law of his element. That is catalyst impact. Now, the parallel thought from last week would be that we learn to devote ourselves into decreasing, right? But it just didn't fit with the direction that God took me in the message. You see, the parallel thought would go right next to it, right? That's what parallel means. But as I started to go into the text in Colossians, I realized it was a perpendicular thought. You know what perpendicular is? So one line's going this way, the other line's going this way, and there you have a right degree angle. The perpendicular thought was we first have to deal with who Jesus is. If I don't know who Jesus is and how big he is, then I'll miss everything down here on the horizontal. So we go into Colossians. Paul writes this letter. It's an epistle. He's writing to the church in Colossus, and he's dealing with doctrinal heresy that entered the church. Same heresies that have entered this church, the church at large, the, the corporate church, the body of Christ, the heresy that's entered straight through those doors and sits down in our sanctuary. And it's two doctrines, and we know this from the way Paul responded to these heresies. One such heresy was they tried to diminish or reduce Jesus from being God to just being a created being. They tried to say he was just a good teacher or that God, yes, created him to do a certain work, to fulfill a certain purpose, but being God himself, nope. So when they reduced his deity, do you understand what they did when they did that? They took away the whole plan of redemption because the sin of humanity can only be dealt with the God of eternity. Without Jesus being God, then he didn't deal with my sin. First heresy. Second heresy, they wanted to add to the work of salvation. They wanted to say that you can work your way into salvation. They wanted to say that you can do good deeds with salvation. You could sacrifice. They wanted to go back to the old sacrificial system. So here Paul is writing an epistle, but the word that is applied to the epistle is polemic. You ever heard of that word? Polemic. It's a polemic epistle, which means he's strongly arguing against the heresy. He's making such a point from the very beginning. We are going to take our cue in verse 15. As Paul writes to them, he says these words, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He wants to get straight to the point about who Jesus is. You see, the misunderstanding was Jesus was just a created being. He was just like an angel. But Paul says, no, he's actually the image of the invisible God. The word image here in Greek comes to us from the Greek word being icon. Icon. Now, if you think about that word and how we apply it to celebrities today, we call certain celebrities iconic, don't we? They are icons, and we put them up on a pedestal. But here Paul's using that word. He's saying, no, Jesus is the truest icon. And the word icon actually means perfect representation. But you can only be a perfect representation of something if you are an actual manifestation of that thing. It's impossible to be a perfect representation unless you are actually the very image and essence of what you are trying to represent. Jesus is God. That's exactly what he's saying. He's saying not only is Jesus God, he's the icon, he's the visible picture of the invisible God, he is the totality of God. And since he is God, he is supreme in rank over all creation. He is the image of the invisible God, verse 15, the firstborn over all creation. Now, I look out into the audience and I see all types of people, and I can already tell this type of people out here, you'll be very familiar with what I'm about to say next. I could tell. You know how I could tell? Because you guys probably, on a daily basis, take selfies, don't you? No? Nobody takes a selfie? See, I knew that was going to happen. Wait, let me talk to this group up here. Do you guys take selfies? I used to, You know what a selfie is, right? It's when you take out your phone and you point it at yourself and you take a picture. That's a selfie. Now, why did I say that? Because if God was going to take a selfie of himself, the picture would look like Jesus. Jesus, the image, the character, the perfect representation of God. 
He is the for, firstborn over all creation. This was fascinating. You know, you'd find out that word firstborn in the original language doesn't actually mean that he was firstborn. It actually means that he was priority over creation. So many people today, even, hey, Christian denominations to this day will take this very verse that we're studying right now and say, see, it says that Jesus was a created being. He was the first person created. Therefore, he's not God. Jehovah's Witnesses say that. Other Christian denominations will hold on to that. They'll say he was not God because of this verse. What they fail to understand is this word, firstborn, is all throughout the Bible. It explains the other children in the Old Testament, such as when Joseph had two boys, Manasseh and Ephraim. It uses the word firstborn to explain his second son. In other words, it means the son of promise, the son of priority. Did you also know that Jacob and Esau, Jacob was the younger brother, Esau was born first. The word firstborn is applied to Jacob. Speaking of the son of promise, he's the son of priority. So here, this is what Paul's saying. He is the image perfectly of the invisible God. He is also supreme in rank over all creation. Why is Paul harping on this? Why am I harping on this? Here's why. Because if we reduce Jesus from being divinity to just his full humanity without being God, you know what we've done? We've bankrupted God's love. You see, it would have been easy for God, creator, to just create someone to go down there and deal with mankind. But the fact that he didn't do it that way, he didn't just create someone and send them down here, go deal with them. And then on his high throne from a distance, just watched. No, he stepped off his throne. He stepped down into humanity's skin and he dealt with the sin problem himself. That's why we must keep Jesus as God, which is the truest doctrine running all throughout the scriptures. He is God in totality, and he's not only the supreme rank over creation, but he's also the transcendent de that deity that stands over creation, and he's also the savior that came so low to die for creation. He's also the power that sustains creation. He is so big that this universe cannot contain him, yet he decided to be so small that he lives inside of your heart. Amen. Praise Jesus for that decision that he made. The word firstborn over all creation also means this, that he was the firstborn out of resurrection. Do you know there were other people that were resurrected? Lazarus, the widow's son from Nain, the other son in the Old Testament with Elijah. They were resurrected too. Did you know that? But they eventually died. Jesus was the only one to experience true resurrection because he will never die again. He had to go through it once and once and for all. That is why we need to keep Jesus up here. That is why we must understand that our role with him is to partner with him in the process of salvation. Now, let me just kind of boil it down to these several next points. Here's the reason why. This should remove all stress, all worry, all concern. Maybe you're a new Christian. Maybe you're not a Christian at all. Maybe you are a seasoned and, and weathered Christian. Maybe this will help. Ready for it? Jesus not only created us, he wrote out every single day for us. Created us, wrote out every single day for us, then he went and said, I'm going to take the penalty of sin for them. I'm going to die for them. Not only just die for them, then I'm going to give you my spirit to live within you. But not just live within you, recreate you. Give you a brand new life and a brand new beginning. But not just that. Now you're going to be the agent of change that the world needs to see. It's the reason why the disciples flipped the world upside down. See, that's an interesting saying itself. You see, the world was already turned upside down because of sin. So when the disciples went around talking about Jesus, what they were doing was turning it right side up. See, when I understand that he lives inside of me, the chemistry of impact is that he will explode outside of me. And there are people in your lives and their worlds are upside down. Yet you have the very agent of salvation that can turn those worlds right side up. So what did he do? He created us. He wrote out our days for us. He paid the penalty of sin for us. He laid down his life for us. He took his life back for us. He gave us his spirit to live within us. And now he's just asking us to partner with him 
so that salvation can be seen on us. We cannot add to his salvation plan. We can only be it so other people see it. Last week I talked about breathing easy or having room to breathe like oxygen in your lungs through tragedy. Because that's what people are going to see. You know, the same tragedy that befalls one household will hit another household. The difference between the two households is one household is trusting in God. They're grieving, they're mourning, they're struggling, but they're breathing a little bit easier than the household down the street. And when another family sees both families, they're going to say, what's the difference? They both are going through an adversity. They're both struggling, yet this family seems to have more oxygen, more room to breathe. What gives? And then right there's a testimony where that one family could say, yes, we are learning to suffer successfully because we trust God who is all powerful and has all sovereignty. So that's oxygen. But then there's other forms of oxygen, oxygen that you give out to the world around you. You may have just come out of an adversity or a tragedy, and you have the gift of oxygen to give to somebody else that's really suffocating. They feel like they're boxed in. They're claustrophobic. They can't breathe. Yet you have the very agent of salvation, but sometimes we don't share it. Why not share this gift of salvation? Why not show somebody else that they can have room to breathe? That they don't have to go through that tragedy suffocating. That is what God has called us to do. So in other words, this is how I'm going to say it. In God's plan to save man, it is your eye that's the missing element. Not this eye. Not this eye. This eye. Capital I. The only missing element in God's plan to save man is you and I. Again, it's not just about doing our part. It's about partnering up with him and allowing him to work through us. I remember leading a Bible study every single day for over four years while I was incarcerated. And I would lead this Bible study and I would spend hours every single morning. I'd wake up at 5 a.m. to beat the lights up and to beat the chaos up that would wake up at 6 a.m., the arguments, the fights, the disputes. I'd wake up extra early to spend extra time breaking fast with the word of life. And I would be so ready to explode upon this housing unit with the Bible. And there would be about 20 plus guys, inmates out of 38, sitting around a table and learning about God's word. But over time, every day, teaching the word, living the word, being the word, doing the word, and having the same people watch it, yet not be convinced by it was frustrating. I would go out in the yard and walk laps. And she's like, what the heck am I doing? Why am I wasting my time? Why am I waking up on my knees for these guys? They don't care. I get like that today sometimes. When I look around. And God said this into my heart. He said, look around, Matthew. It's a group of inmates just everywhere. Just like you would see on prison movies in a yard. And they're all just walking around. And he said, Matthew... Every single one of these souls is already either mine or not. Every single person that I am looking at is already mine or they're not. That hit me. I tried to figure out what did that mean? He said, turn to Revelation. So I turned to the end of the story. And I read the end of the story. And it says that at the throne a representative from every tribe, every tongue, every race, every color will be praising Jesus. And I realized that he already wrote the story out. So here I am frustrated about who's going to get saved and God saying, are you crazy? You're doing work for me, but you're not doing work with me. See, when we do work for him, we get so frustrated when people don't get it, don't we? We get so out of whack and sorts when we're trying to do work for him. All along, he's off to the side saying, I've already done the work. They're either going to get it or they're not. Don't frustrate yourself. Do work with me. And the moment I went back to the housing unit for the rest of that time, that body, it was enjoyable. It wasn't frustrating anymore. I uh, uncovered the word, would give it out to my peers and my tear mates, and I would live it out. And I didn't have to wear what was not mine to wear, that frustration. That's catalyst impact. That is the chemistry of impact. 
Verse 16, finally. For by him, Jesus, all things were created that were in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or, or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Now, again, remember, Paul's trying to convince, he's trying to correct the church at Collis, who is actually heeding and hearing such heresies. Remember, one of the heresies was Jesus isn't God. So Paul goes, no, he's not only the image of the invisible God, he's not only priority and supreme in rank over all creation, but he created everything. He created everything in the physical world. He created everything in the spiritual world. He created everything in heaven. He created everything on earth, whether it be a throne, whether it be a dominion, whether it be a prince, or whether it be a form of power. Jesus created all of it. That's what that says right there. I don't even have enough time to go into all those separate words. All things were created through him and for him. What? John chapter one, the disciple writes, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. Boom. Proverbs eight tells us that Jesus was the wisdom that was with the father in the beginning, creating everything almost as the architect behind creation. So not only is Jesus the agent of creation from the beginning, he's the goal of creation at the end. He's the sustaining power from beginning to end. He's the activating and moving power from beginning to end. It's all about Jesus. He created it all, and all things were created for him, through him, by him, and to him. I don't know what that's going to do to your doctrine or your theology. All I know is when I think about how big he is, the things around me that are troubling shrink. All things were created through him and for him. You know another thing that was created through him and for him? This day. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So if this day that I woke up upon and to was created specifically for Jesus, the question is, what am I doing today to give him back what he's given me? Just today. I don't know about tomorrow. Yesterday's gone. But just the day, if the day was created for Jesus, what am I living with today that is going to be well-pleasing to my Lord and Savior? For by him all things were created, verse 17. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. This is so dynamic right here. Now, he is before all things kind of is reiterating the thought from the previous verse about him creating all things, and all things were created through him, like the architect. All things were created for him, like the builder, and now he exists in between all things like the owner. But this here thought, let me just, let me shrink it real quick. And he is before all things. So the question I must ask myself is, is he really before all things in my life? Does he come before everything else in my life? That's basically what I'm trying to say. When we wake up in the morning, does he come before that next thought? Does he come before the day's agenda? Hey, I get into an argument. Does he come before my response? I'm in a tragedy. I only see the tragedy. I only see the adversity. I only see the pressure. Hold up. Does he come before even your preconceived notion of what's about to happen? Why do we go to those, those places in our mind when something bad happens that we thought it happened to us? Meanwhile, from God's perspective, he said, no, it didn't happen to you. It's happening for you. Now put Jesus before that thing and trust that he has a plan to get you through that thing. And I'm believing if I can wrap my mind around that perspective, everything that I deal with will not be important anymore. Won't be a struggle anymore. Priorities change. My God's still on the throne. And if he came so low to die for me and you, He's got everything else figured out. I'm pretty sure of it. So he is before all things, and you ready for this? In him, all things consist. Now, this isn't just a Christian spin on it. This isn't us trying to make it creative and sound eloquent or for the sake of the message and me trying to sound smart, the chemistry of impact. This is actually the language, and it actually gives way to scientific talk. In him, all things consist. You know, the wording in the original language, Greek, in him, all things consist means in him, all things are held together. And the description that they would give to you to explain that 
is like an atom. How an atom. Now, I've only Googled all this stuff. Don't get it twisted. So don't come up to me afterwards and try to explain to me the, the makeup of an atom. I have no idea. In fact, I don't like chemistry, science, biology, or any of those other things in school. But what I do know is that the language lends us to the idea that in Jesus Christ, all things are held together. So I'll explain to you the laws, the laws of gravity. As you know, if something is thrown up in the air, it's going to come down, right? Then there's the laws of uh, thermodynamics, laws of aerodynamics. There's the laws of chemistry, the laws of radiation. There's the laws of motion. Now, I'm not going to explain any of them. Again, you can Google them pull out your smartphone, take a selfie, and find out what I'm talking about. But I will explain to you the law of electricity. It's called the Columns Law of Electricity. And you will be surprised to know that in the law of electricity, opposites do what? Attract. You know, you see a kid playing with two magnets. What do they do? Well, they first get the positive and the negative, and they connect them. But something happens, and it's even more fun than the connection is when they turn the positive and the positive against one another. And what happens? It repels, right? So the law of electricity says that positive charged protons will always repel. But in science, they can't figure out why in the center of the nucleus are all positive charged protons and they're not repelling. In fact, in the science world, they call it this great mystery. They cannot explain it unless they open the word of God, which already explains what the atomic glue that holds it all together is. It's Jesus Christ because he is before all things, and in him all things are held together. So without him, my life will tend to fall apart. But with him, my life will be set apart. And when my life is set apart with Jesus, I can trust that I'm going to have a purpose for today. And with a purpose, you know what else I have? A hope for tomorrow. That's what he wants to give us, and that's what the world around us needs to see in us. So now we learn literally and physiologically, Jesus is the sustaining power or the atomic glue that holds my life together. You'd also be excited, as I am, to know that what holds us together is called laminin. Now, you may have seen this online. You may have heard of uh, Louis Giglio explaining it the way he did. But I'm going to try my very best to explain laminin. Laminin today, folks, is cell adhesion molecules. Wikipedia. Cell adhesion molecules. What that means is one cell of our body is attached or held together by another cell of our body, and the laminin is the, the, the moving agent that makes that all possible. In other words, it's the scaffolding of cells and tissues. It's the reason why I'm able to stand up here firmly with my skeleton and not be like jello or be like a jellyfish. It's the laminin all throughout your body that makes it possible to be what you are today, right? Cool. Awesome uh, chemistry or scientific lesson, whatever this stuff is. But what you would love to know is that if you were to take a laminin and look at it under a microscope, and this isn't a Christian spin on it, this is actually what you will find in all medical books with the definition I just gave you of laminin and the picture that you will be happy to know and you will see looks just like this. That is laminin. A perfect cross. Now I don't know what that does to you. It gives me spiritual chills to realize that before we had any type of scientific measures to, to look at this type of stuff, microscopes and telescopes to see how large our universe is, God said, I got it all figured out. In fact, I'm going to write it right into your DNA that the cross would be the only way. The redemption and salvation exist on the inside of you. And when you realize how I hold it all together, I'm the sustaining power, goodness gracious, physically, emotionally, Spiritually, I hold you together. Now, you may feel
feel as if, Matt, my life is falling apart. And I hear what you're saying. I believe Jesus is God. I hear that he's the sustaining power. Uh, that's pretty cool about laminin. Uh, I'm not a big fan of chemistry either. What's that got to do with me? And I'm saying, you're looking at it all wrong, friend. You see, your life isn't falling apart. It's falling into place. And once you see it that way, all the things that you're struggling with outside of you will fall right back into the place of what God has before you and for you. See, there's a purpose in your trouble. There's a purpose in your adversity. He wants your attention. He wants to show you that he loves you. He wants to show you that he's holding you in his hand. Verse 17 again, and in him all things consist. By him all things are held together. I'm not just speaking physically anymore. I'm thinking emotionally. He holds everything in my life together emotionally. Even my spiritual maturity, it's in his hands. Even the relationships that feel like they're going in different directions, he's holding that too. He's this sustaining power. He's got it all figured out. So I come to this point where I realize if Jesus is who he says he is, as Paul writes it, with such a polemic way of, of arguing truth to the church at Collis, the question that I must ask myself, I must come to terms with, is if Jesus is the sustainer of this universe so big, then is he the Lord of my life so small? If he's got it all figured out, he's holding the entire universe, it spans in his hand, and he has everything in order, then is he the Lord of my life? Have I entrusted my life to him? Fresh and anew right here, right now, on a Thursday evening before Memorial Day weekend, that I'm going to give my life back to him. We're so hesitant to do that. Every time Pastor Matt says, this altar is open. I think the whole church should flood forward to reaffirm and recommit. You say, I don't know, but today I do. Then I'm going to give my life right back into his hands, the all-sustaining one. I want him to be Lord of my life today. Now let me kind of read these verses and land the plane. You see, as we come out of him being uh, all things created through him and for him, he is before all things. He is the atomic glue that holds all things together. Watch what else he is. He's the head of the body. The church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, the first one to resurrect and not die again, that in all things he may have preeminence. He may be superior. He may be supreme. For it pleased the Father that in Jesus all the fullness should dwell. The fullness? What does that even mean? I don't know what it means. I'm not even going to try to teach you that. But what I do know is the closer I get to Jesus, the fuller I become as a person. And the further away I am from Jesus, the emptier I am as a person. That's the chemistry of impact, church, that all of creation will center around Jesus, that all of our lives are literally physiologically and spiritually held together by Jesus. And if that's true, then my life needs to point people to Jesus. My life needs to find its fulfillment only in Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And the very chemistry of impact has nothing to do with me doing my own part and everything to do with me partnering up with him to do his work, because he also says that apart from me, you can do nothing. And I know that this lesson tonight may have been all over the place with some of the ideas, but the idea behind the idea was for us to understand our role in God's economy. And as I use kind of the periodic table of elements as our graphic and the title, The Chemistry of Impact, over the next several Thursdays, as long as God blesses me to be with you, we're going to talk about how we can take those elements on that periodic table and become the characteristics of a Christian that the world needs to see. We're going to be salt because Jesus said that's what we are. We're going to be like metal. We're going to learn how does it, be, how does it take to, to go through refinement and come out on the other side true. We're going to even be helium. 
You ever heard somebody say, you're like helium? No. But we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about how that gaseous chemical makes people laugh. It's so light, it rises, even though it's attached to a string to the earth. So with those thoughts in mind, I say this to you, church. Since you're not dead, you're not done. We've heard it. Let's do it. God bless.